with the session with Ian Packer, who is reader of history at the University of Lincoln, a specialist in modern English political history, also with an interest in the links between literature and history, author of several volumes on the liberals of Lloyd George and articles on land reform, unemployment and taxation. He is co-editor of the definitive edition of Robert Southey's later poetical works. Ian Packer. And thanks to Joanne for uh, inviting me uh, here today. I must admit, I, I feel a little embarrassed uh, about being here. Um, firstly, because I'm, I'm not a medievalist, and I don't know very much about the Battle of Agincourt. And that's a little intimidating when you're in the same room as uh, people who do know a great deal about the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, and secondly, because I'm aware that um, most of today is a about thinking about how the English have remembered and celebrated Agincourt as a great and inspiring victory. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on attempts in English culture not to celebrate Agincourt. Uh, in fact, to see Agincourt as something about which the English should be rather ashamed. Well, I'm going to start by saying a little, uh, a little about how Ashenkorn was commemorated in English writings after, after 1415. But most of my talk will focus on the most important and sustained attempt from within English culture to contest the celebration of Ashenkorn. And that's uh, by this chap, Robert Southey. There he is, is a lean and hungry young man. And in particular, through Southey's epic poem, <coughs> which is published for the first time in 1796. Now, uh, Southey may not be very well known now, but he was a leading poet, journalist, biographer, social commentator, and historian of the late 18th and early 19th century. And his poem, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, attracted a great deal of attention and controversy. Uh, particularly for its attempt to change how the English looked at the Hundred Years' War. So I'm going to talk about why the poem was written, how it attempted to contest predominant views in England about Agincourt, and its and Saudi's impact on our culture and our view of the past. But as I've said, I'll, I'll start with outlining the kind of mainstream view uh, of Agincourt in English culture that Joan of Arc attempted to contest and indicate the, the scale of the task that Salvi had set himself. Well, the Battle of Agincourt is obviously uh, an outstanding victory uh, by any measurement. Henry V um, did something to try and embed the commemoration of the battle into the nation's life um, through the, uh, the celebration of saints, of Crispinus and Crispinus and John Beverley, whose veneration was associated with the day of the battle, um, the 20th of October. But that didn't really survive the Reformation's destruction of the cult of saints and the creation of the new Tudor and Stuart national calendar of celebrations. Instead, the primary methods of preserving the memory of Agincourt in the long term, I think, have tended to be cultural rather than institutional. And that's in large part, of course, due to the efforts of historians and chroniclers, uh, John Stowe, Edward Hall, Richard Grafton. Like the Holyshed, all those people. But from very early on, there's always been a literary element to this commemoration in the form of song, poetry, and drama. Uh, most famously of all, of course, Shakespeare's The Life of Henry V, uh, 1599. And there are many, many other examples, and Anne Curran's done a great job to elucidate their development and significance. So I won't dwell on them further, other than to make a couple of uh, central points. Firstly, given the significance of literature in preserving the memory of Ashen Corps, I don't think it's surprising that one of the most important challenges to the celebration of the battle came in the form of a poem, uh, Southeast Joan of Arc. 
Secondly, aspects of these literary forms make it very clear why the battle retains an important place in historical uh, memory and why it was exceptionally difficult to challenge the idea of Russian thought as something to celebrate. It's common, for instance, to emphasize that this was a victory of David over Goliath, a vastly outnumbered English force that defeated the cream of the Knights of France. If no author went so far as to claim that um, 21 Englishmen had put to flight 12,000 Frenchmen in a marsh, as uh, Suffolk schoolboys recorded in their exercises in the 1530s, it was certainly the case that the English were this happy few, as Shakespeare has him would say. Who couldn't feel pride at this proof of superior English valour? Moreover, while this was a victory for the skill and bravery of an English monarch who directed and inspired his troops in battle, it was also a victory for the common man, as exemplified by the English bowman's triumph over the French knights on horseback, as detailed in various ballads like Agincourt or the English bowman's glory. Everyone could take pride in Agincourt. Finally, these works tended to appear or to be revived when conflict with the French was looming or actual. They served to reflect and reinforce contemporary patriotic feelings and Francophobia, as well as to celebrate the past. So for instance, uh, Michael Drayton's poem, The Battle of Agincourt, 1627, now of course best known for its first line, Fairs to the Women of France, uh, was published at the time of the Anglo-French War of 1627-1629. Uh, the definitive Agincourt play, if you like, Shakespeare's Henry V, was performed at Covent Garden every year during the Seven Years' War against France from 1756 to 1763. Tellingly, the playbills at this time often advertised performances as for Henry V, with the conquest of the French at Agincourt. <laughs> to see that message. Uh, so in these circumstances, remembering Agincourt, of course, it, it's, it's a patriotic duty. So that raises two questions. Why would anyone in Britain want to contest the celebration of Agincourt? And how could you? How could this be done? Should anyone want to? Well, I think the most likely occasion on which anyone would want to dispute this predominant way of looking at Agincourt was if the country was engaged in a conflict with France that was controversial within Britain and that many British people opposed. And this is exactly what happened, I think, for the first time when Britain and France went to war on the 1st of February 1793. Most conservatively minded people supported the war, both to expel French forces from the Low Countries, um, which they'd occupied in 1792, and to oppose the principles of the French Revolution, which had taken a decidedly more radical turn with the execution of Louis XVI in January 1793. But the revolution had many sympathizers in Britain who objected to a war with France when France was the home of the principles of liberty, republicanism, and religious equality embodied in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the French Convention elected in 1792. People who felt war against France had been engineered by reactionary forces in Europe who were determined to crush the new French Republic. In these circumstances, it was possible for opposing views about Agincourt to emerge in this country. On the one hand, as might be expected, amongst the deluge of patriotic effusions that war brought forth after 1793, there was a surge of material celebrating the victory of the 20th of October 1415. Shakespeare's Henry V was performed 16 times in 1789 to 1792, tensions with France rose, with John Kemble, the leading actor of the day, in a central role. After war was declared in 1793, the plot revived, uh, with uh, the takings from one performance in 1803 donated to the Patriotic Fund, and a concluding occasional address to the volunteers. 
Michael Drayton's Battle of Agincourt was republished in 1793. There was a rush of more populist materials such as the ballads, King Henry V's Conquest of France, 1795, and The Bowmen of Kent, which appeared in the Sporting Magazine in 1793. But radicals in this country were not willing to be silenced in their opposition to the war and their defense of the principles of the French Revolution. They responded not just with speeches and newspaper articles, but with novels and poetry that defended the French or Jacobin cause. And amongst those young radicals was the poet Robert Southey, uh, yes, still only 18 in 1793 when the war was declared. And despite his youth, Southey had been writing extensively since childhood and he was determined to seal his fame by producing an epic poem, the highest form uh, of the art. His historical <coughs> interests were wide-ranging, and he was later on to become a historian of Brazil and of the Peninsula War, and he toyed with the idea of national epics on subjects as diverse as Brutus, uh, King, e King Egbert of Wessex, and Richard III. Uh, not all ones, I mean, <laughs> um, but the war with France sent him in a new direction, and in July 1793, he decided his poem would be set in France during the Hundred Years' War, and that he intended to directly challenge the celebratory discourse that surrounded Agincourt. But how? Well, Southey decided the best way would be by not concentrating. Instead, he would write about the Hundred Years' War from a French perspective, and he would focus on a French epic hero, not on Henry V. His subject would be, there she is, Joan of Arc. That's uh, the picture of her that appears in the second edition of Sally's poem. His subject would be Joan of Arc and the French victories at Orléans and Pâté in 1429, the turning points of the Hundred Years' War that led eventually to the final French victories in 1453. Agincourt would be dealt with in Southey's poem, but only marginally and in retrospect. And it would be contextualised as only one English success within an overall narrative of French victory. Southey believed that in both 1429 and 1793, a French victory was just and right. And if an English audience could be brought to see this for the Hundred Years' War, they might have accepted in the 1790s. Quite as much as any patriotic performance of Henry V, Southey's poem was meant to have a contemporary application. As Southey defiantly stated in his introduction, to Joan of Arc, 1796. And this really is a declaration of war on the, the reading public. <coughs> it has been established as a necessary rule for the epic that the subject be national. To this rule, I have acted in direct opposition and chosen for the subject of my poem the defeat of my country. If among my readers, there be one who can wish success to injustice because his countrymen supported it, I desire not that man's approbation. So you can't say you haven't been warned. <laughs> <laughs> All Sally had to do, of course, was to actually write his poem, and that proved a, a, a rather complex process. After he'd read up uh, on the events connected to Joan of Arc's life and some standard histories, the first draft was written in six weeks, in August to September 1793. As was traditional for epic poems, this version ran to 12 books and dealt with a fairly concentrated version of events in Joan's life in 1429. Uh, the announcement of her divine mission, her acceptance at the court of Charles VII, the lifting of the siege of Orléans by French forces inspired by Joan, the French victory of Pate, and as a finale, the coronation of Charles VII at Reims. As this was a poem about the triumph of France, Joan's betrayal on execution in 1431 was not dealt with in the action of the poem. 
And this basic structure remained in place through a series of large-scale rewrites. Um, Sadly, found a publisher at the end of 1794, I think Joseph Cottle, a young Bristol bookseller, and the kind of radical. He then rewrote his poem in May to November 1795 as it was going to compress, compressed it to 10 books, changed some of the characters, reduced the supernatural element, um, accepted some contributions from his brother in law, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and in 1796, the poem was published. Stanley remained rather unsatisfied with it though, made substantial revisions to the second edition of 1798, removing Coleridge's contributions as the two of them had fallen out, <coughs> and then there are further editions in 1806, 1812, 1837. Mm -hmm. But the basic structure and message of the poem had never changed. Now, this long drawn out process of composition reflected Stanley's struggles to find his individual voice as a poet and to break out into the traditional format of the classical epic. Poem, but they also reflected the difficulty of the task in setting himself. By choosing Joan of Arc as opposed to Henry V as his hero, he had to find a way of overcoming Joan's, to say the least, negative perception in English minds, in addition to demonstrating that her cause, the French cause, was entirely justified. Shakespeare in Henry VI, Part I, had followed English chroniclers like Collinshed in labelling Joan a witch in League of the Devil. And that image was still current in the 1790s. Um, Sally was outraged by a performance he saw at Common Garden in February 1798 of uh, an entire new grand historical ballet of action called Joan of Arc or the Maid of Orleans, uh, the climax of which was Joan being carried off to hell by Beelzebub. Um, <laughs> there were deference to a 1790s audience's expectations of some romance in their ballets, Joan's motive for fighting the uh, in the ballet are jealousy of her sister's relationship with the English commander Talbot, uh, most exactly a kind of a love triumph. Yeah. Um, uh, but skeptical British historians like David Hume, whose history of England sadly drew on as a source of his poem, uh, and a better for his purposes as they do Joe as a deluded fanatic. Sally's solution was nothing if not radical. He presented Joan as a French revolutionary of the 1790s who just happened to be living in the 1420s, <laughs> and uh, as a member of the French peasantry who represented the striving of ordinary people for a more just society. Inescapable historical facts meant the climax of the poem was a crown of the Charles of Seventh of Reims, but the poem's last section is an impassioned lecture for Joan against the new king. She announces that she has anointed the chief servant of the people and warns him not to lead his people walls to aggrandize thyself or to ignore the feeble cry of asking hunger. Charles' task is to feed the hungry ones and be the orphan's father. If not, hiring guards, though fleshed in slaughter, would be weak to save the tyrant on the blood-cemented throne that totters underneath him. In other words, the king can rule as long as he serves his people. If he doesn't, off with his head, as with Louis XVI. And the vice and folly of the king's court is represented in Ephesus as an unflattering light compared to Joan's simple peasant virtues. Moreover, Joan represents a dazed religious sensibility, much like the ideas popularized by Rousseau and Voltaire that were widespread among the French revolutionaries, uh, and at this time sounding, rather than state sponsored Orthodox Christianity. Joan has been raised in the depths of the forest by Bizardo, uh, an old hermit. As she says to the doctors of theology who examine her at the court of Charles VII, in forest shade, my infant years trained up, knew not devotion's forms, the chaunted mass, the silver altar and religious robe, the mystic way from the hallowed cup, God's priest created, are to me unknown. Instead, to her, she says, all nature's voice proclaimed the all good parent. Joan's religion comes from nature and the heart of man, not the church. And of course, she duly confounds the theologians and going on to lead the French to victory. So in Southey's poem, Joan is not a witch or a fanatic. She represents universal republican values, values that are as applicable in England as in France. And she's also a radical hero who stands in direct contrast to the odious Henry V. She 
She's a peasant, rather than a king, and a disciple of Rousseau, not a, a pious son of the church, or religious fanatic. Now, Sally, of course, also had to demonstrate the justice of the French cause in the Hundred Years' War. And he did this by making it a theme that runs through the whole poem. From the first book, there are constant reminders that it is the English who are the invader. And they're often just referred to that as the invader. And of the horrors of the war they've inflicted on France. Um, Fertile fields lay waste, dispeopled hamlets, the lawn widows groan, and the pale orphans feeble cry for bread. The English are persistently accused of what we call now war crimes. Their savage fury spares not grey age and mocks the infant's shriek as he does writhe upon his cursed lance and forces to his foul embrace the wife, even on her murdered husband's gasping corpse. They refuse Joan's offer um, to retire to England in peace, and the English commanders, Talbot and Falstaff, are represented as boorish and bellicose, though not always in Falstaff's case particularly brave. After Joan defeats them and crowns Charles VII of Reims, the poem ends with the prayer, ever may the all just give to the, give to the arms of freedom such success, thus making it clear that the French victory is to be seen as a triumph for justice and one that English weakness should endorse. But Sally thought he couldn't write a poem on the Hundred Years' War and totally ignore Agincourt. If he was going to change his audience's view of that conflict, and thus hopefully the end of the French War in the 1790s, he had to also make them see the battle to which they primarily interpreted that war in an entirely different light. So, rather than Agincourt being the centrepiece of the poem, it's, it's merely recounted in retrospect. In book two of Joan of Arc, uh, making it clear that Agincourt was not the most important event in the Hundred Years' War, and that while it was an English victory, it shouldn't give English readers confidence they would defeat the revolution in France, as Agincourt had been followed by the French victories at Orléans and Pate, that were the main features of Joan of Arc. But Sally didn't leave matters there. He felt he had to thoroughly dismantle Agincourt's image as a glorious victory that inspired Englishmen to rebel in the wars of France. And Sally did this by having the events of Agincourt recounted by an old Frenchman, Bertrand, who had fought there, thus giving his readers an account of the battle, which Sally calls Agincourt, the French name, uh, from a French perspective. So in book two, Bertrand describes the valour of France's leaders, particularly Charles Duc d'Orléans, who of course was a poet, and that's a, a favourite of Sally's, and provides a melancholy role for all of the many noble French dead. Southey also reverses the usual image of the French superiority in numbers in the battle by not describing its early stages and concentrating on its final moments when it is Orléans and Bertrand who are surrounded, wounded, and outnumbered. Like wolves, they hemmed us in, fierce in unhoped for conquest all around our dead and dying country. After the battle is over, Southey makes a crucial point about how his audience should interpret this English victory. In Shakespeare's Henry V, we see matters from the English perspective. It's reported that the king had learnt the treacherous French had looted his supply train and massacred the boys charged with guarding it, as Shakespeare says, expressly against the law of arms. In response, the enraged king orders the killing of his French prisoners. In Joan of Arc, we see things from the French perspective. Bertram has fought valiantly in the battle and is a prisoner. He doesn't know anything about events of the supply train. Sally doesn't mention them. All Bertram knows is that the king has ordered the bound prisoners to be slaughtered. Bertram escapes because his captain refuses to follow the king's orders. Here, it's the English, not the French, who end the battle with a war crime, the killing of prisoners of war. Sally makes no mention in Joan of Arc 1796 of the English bowmen and their commoners' victory over the French knights. Instead, he concentrates on Henry V. And the murder of the French captives is not the end of the poem's condemnation of the English king. Bertram, and he's a very unlucky chap, Bertram, Bertram has had the bad luck to be trapped with his family inside Rouen when it's besieged by Henry V in 1418 19. 
Bertram recounts that Henry's uh, ambitious ear, best pleased with the walls clamour and the groan of death, was deaf to prayer on behalf of the suffering inhabitants, and that he refused to let the children hold an infirmity of the city. Instead, he relaxed his stern face into savage merriment, scoffing their agonies. When Southey revised his poem in 1798, the footnotes to Book Two were expanded to give yet more evidence of Henry's monstrous behaviour. His despotic barbarity in expelling the population of Arfleur, his execution of several leading citizens of Col, and making the noble French captives at Agincourt wait on him at dinner after the battle. In fact, Southey declared, the more I learn of his character, the same this character, the more detestable it appears. And he took to referring to him as our wicked Henry V, whom I take to be as bad a man as ever wore a crown. So that's like worse than being his car. So, instead of adding thought as a victory for the English bowman, it becomes a Joan of Arc, a victory by an English king, and the very worst of English kings graced by a record of war crimes and barbarity. The Round of Old Home, when Joan is taken on a Dante-type tour of the underworld in Book 9, she encounters Henry V in hell, where he is identified with considerable irony as the hero conqueror of Azincourt. His place is among the murderers of mankind, and the shade of Henry V confesses to Joan, I sent a lord murder and rape and therefore am I doomed. The contrast between the actions of royalty and the heroic peasant of Joan couldn't be more direct, and it embodies the contrast between what monarchy stands for both in the 15th century and the 1790s, and the ideals of the revolution that are embodied in the ordinary people of France. So, what was the impact of Saudi's epic poem when it finally appeared at the end of 1795? Essentially, it was a succès de scandale. As Southey said, it was the means by which his name first became known to the public and acquired a notoriety which has never been loosened. It sold out despite its high price at the beginning and was reprinted 13 times down to 1855. Generally, radical reviewers admired Joan and saw its political point straight away. The monthly review was clear that Southey had chosen the subject with a view to modern application quoted Joan's account of Henry V in hell at length as a specimen of the poet's political sentiments. The conservative reviewers of the anti-Jacobin were, on the other hand, furious. Is there not a squint of malignity, a treacherous illusion in such a picture? And was it not a seditious rather than a poetic spirit that first contemplated, contemplated the Maid of Orléans as the heroine of an English epic? The, uh, time well-known poet, Anna Seward, the Swan of Litchfield, was moved to write her own poem in response to Joan of Arc, appeared in the Morning Chronicle, in which she particularly attacked Southey's portrayal of Henry V, who graced the crown he wore Britannia's boast, and Southey's attempt to turn to deadliest aconite the long wreaths of Asenhor. For Seward, it was crucial to defend Henry's reputation, as this was central to the whole justification of the English position in the Hundred Years' War, and thus by implication of war in the 1790s. To Seward, Henry was entirely correct in waging war on France. What claimed he then from France at the sword's point but ceded rights, she declared. Moreover, Henry was not guilty of war crimes, as, well, he couldn't be, because he's an English king. Um, as England, whose martial fire applauding ages had pronounced the dawn with fair munificence. Seward urged Saudi not to waste his time on lamenting the French state of the Hundred Years' War, but consider those killed by the French revolutionaries, thus slipping into her own, her own justification for waging war in the 1790s. Joan of Arc was hated by conservatives, but it was so well known that it became a kind of shorthand way of referring to Saudi himself. Uh, as we can see here, uh, he's portrayed as the jackass-headed worshipper at the cornucopia of ignorance in James Gilray's famous cartoon, The New Morality. And you can see that's, that's Salvi there in the blue jacket with that acid head on. And you know it's Salvi because what's sticking out of his pocket? A 
a copy of Joan of Arc. So if you see Joan of Arc, you know the Saudi. But <coughs> what was the wider impact of his attempt to transform the English ways of looking at that of his war? Well, Joan of Arc was part, and I think a principal part, in, in, in of the wider revival of epic writing in Britain at the end of the 18th century. And as some of these epics followed Saudi in taking a radical approach, his publisher Cottle, for instance, wrote a, an epic called Alfred, an epic poem in 1801. But most of the epic poems at this time were staunchly conservative, like the poet laureate Henry Pye's take on Alfred, or Sir James Bland Burgess's Richard the First, 1801. If you think Joan of Arc is not a good poem, you should try reading Richard the First. It's one of the worst poems in the English language. Um, the, hundred, the Hundred Years' War did not become a popular setting for epic poetry. I think the only other epic at the time set in the Hundred Years' War is Margaret Holford Hodgson's Margaret of Anjou, which comes out in 1816, and isn't political at all. I think the only epic poem that followed Southey in taking uh, England's defeat as the central theme was Thomas Northmore's Washington or Liberty of the Storm of 1809. Some radical writers like Hazlitt uh, agreed with Southey in expressing their dislike for Henry V. The Hazlitt, he was just fond of war and no company. But that certainly didn't become the predominant view. And it took a long time for Joan Park to become a plausible English hero. I think it's not until feminists become interested in her in the late 19th, early 20th century, and then the alliance with France in World War I, that she gets voted in this country. And Agincourt has continued to be celebrated as a great English victory, especially in time of the war down into the 20th century, as witnessed by Arthur Aitchen's First World War story, The Bowman, 1914, and of course, Olivier's patriotic film, Henry V, which comes out in 1944. Even South eventually modified his views. He never disclaimed Joan of Arc or rewrote his political message, but his opinion of the justifiability of war with France did alter. After Napoleon became Emperor of the French in 1804, South increasingly supported the British war effort against France as an attempt to defeat a tyrant by Napoleon who rivaled Henry V, so not quite as bad. <coughs> And once France invaded Spain and Portugal in 1807-8, he saw the war as a struggle for national liberation that must be supported at all costs. And he ended up celebrating the final defeat of France at Waterloo in 1815 in his own poem, The Poet's Pilgrimage to Waterloo, which comes out in 1816. Agincourt became one of the English leaders of France that Sally was happy to mention in some of his later poems, such as his funeral song for Prince of Charlotte and by the 1820s, Saudi had moved a long way from his earlier radicalism and became a, a rather idiosyncratic conservative and poet laureate. His view of Henry V, though, took longer to alter. Um, the king was certainly not included in the sovereigns celebrated in Saudi's poem, A Vision of Judgment of 1821, despite what he saw Saudi's friends in the Americas. By the time Southey wrote one of his final works, his Lives of British Admirals, which came out in 1833 to 1840, he'd come to some final conclusions about the events he'd written about 50 years before. Agincourt, he can see, I know, was one of those ever memorable victories, the remembrance of which continues to support the national spirit whereby they are achieved. But, he still believed when looking at Henry V's walls, no Englishman can delight to dwell upon the details. Henry was a merciless conqueror and made himself clear. Don't think what was going to happen. The best Southey would say about Henry was that at least some of his piety was genuine. Though ambition and policy may have entered largely into his motives, devotion was so. So, looking at Saudi's lack of success in redefining the views about Agincourt and his own gradual retreat from his own radicalism, one conclusion might be that it's just not possible to sustain the anti-Agincourt line that Saudi had taken in 1793. 
celebrated reviews of the battle were too deeply entrenched in English culture. And it was only in the particular, the very particular circumstances of the 1790s when the war with France was deeply opposed by substantial sections of British opinion that there was any possibility of challenging these views and then only fleeting them. However, I'm not going to end with that point um, because I think it does need to be qualified. Because Joan of Arc was not the only work that Saudi wrote in the 1790s that was set during the Hundred Years' War. There was another one. Oh. <laughs> also composed a play in 1794 entitled What Tyler or What Tyler Dramatic Poet. As you might guess, its theme was the leader of the Peasant Revolt of 1381. And in three acts, it takes the audience from the origins of the rebellion in Watts Village to his defeat at Blackheath by the forces of Richard II. <clears throat> now, as you might perhaps expect, uh, the play rehearses many of the themes of Joan of Arc. What Tyler represents the virtuous common people standing up against injustice and tyranny. And the priest, John Bull, articulates the deist natural religion that Joan of Arc espouses. The contemporary application of obvious, just as Joan of Arc, uh, as shall be celebrated in the peasant rebels of 1381, some early forerunners of the English radicals of the 1790s. But what Tyler was also, quite as explicitly as Joan of Arc, a protest against war with France. The revolt is ignited in Act One by the depredations of a tax gatherer. And Tyler and his friend Hobb make clear that the unjust taxes that their relatives <coughs> are being levied to madly prosecute the war, draining our wealth distressing our poor peasants, slaughtering our youths, and all to crown our chiefs with glory. It's hot. And Tyler follows this with this ringing declaration. Think ye, my friend, that I, a humble blacksmith here at Deptford, would part with these six groats, earned by hard toil, all that I have, to massacre the Frenchmen, to murder his enemies, men I never saw, did not the state compel me? Well, the play uh, was not published by Ridgway and Simons, the radical publishers to whom South assented in 1794. But, much to his embarrassment, it was published in 1817, when Southey's views had substantially changed. His attempt to halt its publication by an injunction failed over a copyright dispute. And the fact that it was authored by someone who was by then a well-known conservative writer made the authorities wary of the embarrassment that might be caused if anyone publishing it was prosecuted for sedition. As a result, Watt Tyler became one of the most explicitly radical publications to make its way into the public domain in the late 1810s. And as the copyright was disputed, anyone could publish it in cheap editions without paying Saudi a penny. This <laughs> adds insult to injury. <laughs> as a result, it may, we don't know exactly, but it may have sold as many as 30,000 to 40,000 copies, making it, in terms of the time, a huge bestseller. It's the only one of Saudi's works that puts him in the league with the real big hitters, Byron and Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> Saudi was mortified. <laughs> Despite his best efforts in 1817, he'd given an enormous boost to Walt Tyler's reputation as a radical hero. <laughs> Saudi's play became a favourite of Chartist leaders like George and Julian Harley. And if you look at the Chartist press in the 1830s and the 1840s, um, it quite, bits of it are quite widely reprinted in the movement's verse and, and balance sheets. <coughs> Walt Tyler appeared on banners at Reform League demonstrations in 1867, favour of extending the vote. He was celebrated by William Morris in the Dream of John Ball. 
the uh, Labour Control of London County Council named a road in Lewisham after him in 1934. And as I've been witness myself, on the 600th anniversary of the Peasants' Revolt in 1981, Walt Tyler was commemorated in just about everything from a Socialist Workers' Party pamphlet by Paul Foote to a sermon by the Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> standing on the wagon at Blackheath. A slogan of the poll tax rioters in 1990 was Avenge Watt Tyler, and today you can even enjoy a pint of Itchen Valley Watt Tyler Ale, if you wish. So I think somebody played a crucial Oh, boosting Watt's reputation as a radical hero. The younger, radical Saudi may have failed to destroy Agincourt's place in English affections, but he did help to establish Watt Tyler's importance as a symbol of radicals. Someone from the Hundred Years' War whom radicals could celebrate as an alternative to the cult of Henry V. And in doing so, Saudi cemented one way in which Agincourt can be problematised. As Walt Tyler says in Southern's play, the French are not his enemies. His enemy is here in England, and that enemy is those who run the English state and who seek to involve Watt in wars which only serve to glorify those in power. The real enemy of ordinary English people is here, not abroad, in France or elsewhere. And the people's interests and the cause of justice would be much better served by concentrating on reform at home than on aggressive wars elsewhere. As a critique of foreign wars, including the Hundred Years' War, that's an argument that's proved much more resilient than Saudi's attack on the celebration of Agincourt, and it's still very much with us.